good all this. Okay, hi everyone and welcome uh, to another um, postgraduate workshop with uh, Dr. Robert Lingard. He's doing kind of a second workshop on in vivo, this time using in vivo uh, for literature review. So I've posted a link in the chat box to become a member of the Postgraduate Association and we are recording and the recording will go to our YouTube channel. So I'll post a link to that as well. Um, it's all yours, Robert. The stage is yours. Okay. Um, before we get into it, yeah. can I suggest that those of you who have in vivo active on your machines, open it up so you can play along at home. So if you open that up, now also, because we're talking about literature reviews, if you have an endnote file that you are using to gather your data into, or Zotero, or whatever it is you're using, then also have that open and ready as well. <clears throat> so it'll be a play, a play along with. So you get to uh, have a bit of a go and start to manipulate some of the references and the data yourselves. So that at the end of this, you will have the first steps in place for doing your literature review and understanding some of the uh, the steps that you can undertake. Now, this is going to be a, a general approach and some tips and tricks for how to do it. So I suggest that you combine what you pick up in this workshop with what you will find in the one that was done about a month ago and you will find on the, was it the YouTube channel? Uh, for the Postgrad Association. And if I can do a, a mutual plug here, the Postgrad Association was such a wonderful thing for me when I was coming through as a student. I thoroughly recommend that you join up and um, get the benefits of being a part of that community. Okay, I don't have either of those. So CJ, I'm guessing you're referring to En Vivo and EndNote? Correct? Yep. I yeah, that's agree. correct. <laughs> Sorry, I, I've just gone through my previous emails and I, I didn't see, I've I'm obviously missed. Okay. No, no, it, it's not necessary. It's just that I know that some people have already started playing with Envivo and some have already started developing their EndNote libraries. And not everybody uses EndNote. But if you can uh, pull up your bibliographic library, um, that will be good. And for those that don't have one, I'll make some comments on that a little bit later as well. Um, so for so those who have it. Just while we're there, um, people can download in vivo from the SCU. SCU website, you can download it and then contact our tech services to get the activation key. So okay. there are two parts. One is to download it. And then the second one is to activate it. Okay. Now, okay. for those who don't have it, that's okay. Hopefully, this will still provide the uh, the tips and tricks to orient you for when you engage with it directly. And for others, um, a chance to have a bit of a play as we go along. So, okay, that's a bit superfluous now. I'd, look, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the lands on which I dare say most of us are meeting today, uh, being Aboriginal lands. I come from the beautiful Bunjalung. Uh, nation. Um, I'm in Lismore, presently um, inundated with a lot of rain, but it's a beautiful place. I acknowledge it as a site of learning over many, many generations. And although I'm not Indigenous myself, um, what I hope to do today is to um, also continue in that space of respectful education, acknowledging those who have become, who have come before, and acknowledging the, the leadership of the uh, local Indigenous tribes and their elders, past, present and future. So it looks like we've got about uh, 14 people here uh, for the workshop this morning. Can I ask if you open your chat uh, window and just give us a brief introduction? <coughs> your name is going to come up. But let us know what course are you studying in? What is your discipline? So course, are you doing masters? Are you doing your PhD? Uh, what discipline are you in health or education or environment And how far into your lit review are you? Some I've discovered will be 
uh, total newbies to their lit review right at the very beginning. Others will be part way through, perhaps even near the end and just wondering what uh, tools they might still be able to access or how things might have happened. Okay, Indigenous knowledge just at the beginning, doing honours. Nice to have you here, Anna. Lifestyle MedPel, part way, never used in Vivo. Oh, we're going to fix that, see. Uh, Karen, health PhD, completed considerable amount of literature review. Okay. So what you'll see today, Karen, might not, it, it depends on where you're at with it and how comfortable you are. Um, it might help you backfill some things or at least give you some ideas to help with the analysis uh, for the ongoing part of your um, of your uh, research and study. Mm -hmm. Marisha, PhD in sustainable tourism, very protected areas. Aha, uh -huh. revising literature review. Okay. Uh, PhD, education. Okay, so there's some good stuff there for Peter, Gabriella. I hope I'm pronouncing names correctly. Masters in ecology, partway through. Psych, starting. MBA. Okay. Ali as well. Okay, so we're at lots of different stages. Some are well into their literature review, so have a fair idea what they're doing already. For others, it's something that they haven't really engaged with yet. And I also pick up there is a variety of levels of experience with Envivo. I just read this last one. I've been using Mendeley for citations, that's good. I've also used Volsview for some density possible. Ooh, bibliographic data. Okay. Okay. Vosview, I'm not familiar with, but it's all data that can be imported and used. Um, AD is making or raises an interesting point here using Mendeley for citations. Some people will use Zotero, um, I think that's Freebie One. For others, you can actually generate citation lists uh, just using Word. So there's a whole range of bibliographic uh, software available to you. Now, I'm not going to show you how to use it today. For that, um, the university has the license for EndNote. EndNote can be your friend if you don't use bibliographic software yet. It's a pain in the butt to start with. Um, it's also my complaint about in vivo. It takes quite a little bit to get used to it initially. But as you put in the effort to use the software tools, you will find that your competence builds, your confidence grows, but also the library excuse me, your academic library will also grow in EndNote, which will be of increasing value to you as you progress with your studies and then later on into your careers, for which you'll be making a reference back to some of these works that you've found already. Um, manually connected, I use EndNote and Vivo, I'm not sure we can need to connect. Aha, Shastri, you are jumping ahead. Very well thought through. I'm talking about Envivo and EndNote because they are able to be interconnected and that will just save you a ton of space and add to the uh, ability of your research to be audited. Um, it's very rarely done, I expect, but it's good to know that you are able to, uh, to create an audit pathway, something that I addressed in the previous workshop and I'd recommend that you go and have a review of that later um, if you need a little bit more insight into Envivo. Uh, is, uh, Karen's asking, is Envivo used for thematic analysis? Karen, it's used for thematic analysis, content analysis, um, <laughs> causal analysis. Uh, lots of different types of analysis can be um, done through Envivo. It's also something that you can apply to text, uh, to visuals, to audios, to videos. So it's, oh, excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, I'm recovering from a cold. Um, okay, we'll get to that later, uh, CJ, with Envivo for that link for you. Um, <coughs> excuse me. 
what I was going to say too is uh, CJ asking about in visa. If you are using a computer on campus, you will find that Envivo is already loaded, uh, uploaded and active on that computer for you. But if you have an arrangement whereby you're using um, your own computer or some other arrangement, then tech services will be able to help you with activating it. Okay, so we've got a range of experiences. Some are using Endnotes, some are not uh, using at this point. What I would like to do is to demonstrate how to analyze literature using Envivo as a part of a literature review. So a specific application for Envivo. Now the application for a literature review really can be applied to almost any analysis you're doing. Every analysis will have its own specific goals, its own specific questions that it is trying to achieve. But it's just a matter of learning what the tools and functionalities of Envivo are and then solving the, the logic problem of how to get the best out of what you're doing. Second thing is sort of consequential to this. Um, have a look at how Envivo might be used for content analysis. Thematic analysis can be done very similarly to content analysis. So you'll see how that works and hopefully be able to apply that as well. So we've got some experience already noted with Envivo. So I think we've got that one covered. Um, just the disclaimer I always give for this, I'm a practitioner rather than an expert in so much as I've been using Envivo for quite a long time. I started off when Envivo 8 was being turned into Envivo 9, and now we're up to about 14, depending on what machine you're using and which version uh, you have on your machine. I've been using it in quite a few different applications. Initially for my PhD, I had a huge number of sources that needed to be juggled, discovered PhD, saved my life. I have drunk the Kool-Aid um, and think it's a great tool. So what did I do with it as far as my literature review goes? For my literature review, I was investigating the question of attitudes to reproductive cloning, specifically within Australia and within a particular uh, time period. So you'll see on the, the blue side of the screen uh, my general criteria for the literature that I was looking for. On the second side of the screen, you'll see the table that shows what I actually found and how I reduced down the number of references that I had to play with. Um, if you look it up, you'll see I was actually a little bit obsessed at the time and searched over 7,000 different titles uh, to end up with just 17. And if you actually pull it apart even further from that 7,000, I actually only found one. And the 16 others were found from other sources and so on. But what it means is I was able to use the library resources of the university with my search criteria and say, this, this collection here are titles of interest to my project. I was then able to screen them by title and say, right, these ones look interesting and these ones clearly aren't what I'm after. Where the title was of interest, I then read the abstract and thought, right, this one I keep, this one I throw out. I then had 88 uh, from my ProcQuest and EBSCO searches. So 88 of them, which I then imported from EndNote into my uh, Envivo project and then was able to read the articles in full and commence the analysis. So this is where EndNote and then Vivo um, come together and interact. What I recommend is that every time that you find an article that's of interest to you, that you save it and its PDF into EndNote or whichever software platform you're using, 
I'm just going to talk about EndNote, but please understand that if you're using Zotero or Mendeley or whatever, that's still appropriate. But save your reference, the, the PDF of your reference into EndNote and all the relevant bibliographic data there that you want. You can also go into notes uh, in EndNote and add in anything that you think is appropriate. If you want to write your own summary of the article, then put that there. And all of that can then be brought over automatically and embedded into Envivo. So the first thing is think about what it is uh, that you're looking for, how you're going to go through your screening process, and then use the tools that the university makes available for you. Okay, so that's what I did initially. Just thanks very much. Um, okay. Oh, didn't change screens. Try that one. I recommend that if you are engaging with your literature review that you think of it in the same way that you might a more conventional research project. Now, while we might use different language and say it's a literature review, we're just looking at the literature, in a way we are still doing some sort of research on it. We are still extracting information. We are still analyzing and uh, playing with the, with the information that we have in the documents that we've uh, that we've assembled. And look, while I'm talking about documents, I also acknowledge and recently had experience with a PhD student who, as a result of his work, is including an analysis of graphics, so paintings and artworks. But they will also form part of his uh, review as well. Generally, we're talking about literature. I expect 95% of us will be using uh, textual material, but there are some who will be using uh, graphic material as well as part of their review. Now, these are things to discuss with supervisors. What is the purpose of your literature review? What is the focus of it? Are you interested in the way that theories have been applied or what different theories um, have brought about? Uh, do, they, do different theories show different outcomes? Are you interested in focusing in, on different methods? Or perhaps it's a chronology. So it might be that you're looking at the development of ideas across times or uh, critical moments where there was a sudden change or a, a new thing developed. Or perhaps it's something you're doing that works um, across several different disciplinary boundaries. So maybe health and finance or health and tourism or something like that. So you need to understand um, what the focus is going to be for your literature review. And then back, uh, you reflect that back on yourself. So exactly what are the approaches that you will take? So you've got an idea of what the focus is. But we often forget that we should also be thinking about what our perspective is going to be as well. What are the theoretical assumptions that we will be adopting for our literature review. Now, the um, different theoretical perspectives will be things like constructivism versus um, interpretivism or critical realism. So different theoretical approaches. Different methods. Now, if you're, in, um, if you're looking at medical interventions, there'll be a whole range of uh, methods are, that are applied there. Or if you're doing uh, quantitative work, you'll be interested in um, thematic versus content analysis, for example. There will be time delimiters on your research as well. Are you looking for developments in the last 10 years? Or were there some critical developments or political changes that set the dates around your review? Or was there you know, th this wonderful thing that um, this great research has started way back in 2012? And so you just want to look at the things that have happened since then. So think about uh, the approaches that you are taking and then set the limits around the discipline areas that you're looking at as well. You may find that the thing that you are, are looking at 
is commented on within a whole range of different disciplines. But you want to look at it from within particular disciplinary boundaries. So consider all the different parameters that need to be set in place and not just think about what it is that you're focusing on, but let it also inform what approach you are taking as well. Uh, okay, just going back to the chat. Uh, Karen says you need a license key. Yes, uh, contact tax tech services and ask them for the license key. They'll be able to email that through to you and you'll be able to uh, get your, um, your program up and running. I should say too, at any point, please interrupt me. If I haven't explained something clearly or what I've said raises another question, please make sure that you ask it. So just uh, rather than just put your hand up, which relies on me seeing about four different parts of my screen, uh, please just interrupt me uh, by turning on your microphone. Okay, are there any questions at this point? I would think it's fairly straightforward. And for those who are advancing on their literature review, these are things you've probably got sorted. Okay. Before you get into your project, there's some general setup that I recommend that you do. I recommend creating a folder called general that you are able to just go and drop codes in. So codes are the titles that you give or the labels that you give to bits of text, or if you're working with graphics, bits of, bits of the pictures that you're working with, that you set up this general folder where they can just be dropped into. But I also recommend uh, from experience that when you're doing your literature review, that the next three codes also get set up. So one that's called Go Find. Go Find is so that when you are reading through, a, say, a journal article and you come across something that's really interesting or there's a reference to uh, another article that you think, gee, I need to go and follow up on that, then you have this Go Find. So you just mark it down as Go Find and later on in the day when you're a bit weary, you just go back to your Go Finds and go hunt out this extra uh, literature that that you think is going to be relevant. I recommend that you create another code called quotes. And quotes is where you use that to label the, the bits of text that you think this is so good, I might actually use this in my writing later. Or this is something that I have to report to my supervisors when next I meet with them. Uh, the other one that I recommend making is called definitions. So definitions is when you are seeing the way that um, the particular concept is being defined and discussed within one paper that will be perhaps a little bit different to another one, but you've just got this uh, growing database easily accessed called definitions. So they're just three extras, go find quotes and definitions. And we'll have a little bit of a play and I'll show you how to set up uh, codes in a minute. Also, we will be creating folders so as to code for each phase of analysis. For those who are, who are imposing a predetermined code, uh, a predetermined framework, then that can also be set up in advance to doing any major works. As well, because uh, you're working in a team with your supervisors, I suggest setting up uh, folders and memos so that you can drop notes in there, uh, record supervisory meetings, things that are useful, set up uh, an area for your research reflections, and then just a general folder where other things can be kept or bits of your writing might be uh, developed. Now, do we have a volunteer? Is there someone here who would like to open up their, excuse me, open up their Envigo and be the guinea pig to help demonstrate some of these things? I need a volunteer. Oh, everyone's going quiet. B, how do you feel about doing it? Have you got it in I, I don't have it. You haven't? Oh, okay, that lets you off the hook. 
Yeah, I'm up Just for you. Oh, is, is, is someone else volunteering? Shastri, you've got in vivo? Yeah, I got uh, in vivo. How would you feel about sharing your screen? Yeah, I'll try my best uh, to share. Okay. I will stop share. And if there are others there who would like to open up in vivo, and we'll just guide you through just so you can see how this works and also have a little bit of practice with it yourself. Okay, have you got something to share, Shastri? It says uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh. Um, I think we just have to add Shastri. Hang on. Alison's just making that adjustment. Okay. I'm not sure how. Sorry. Just need to make him a co-host. Yeah. Okay, if that's not going to work, I will open yeah, it's mine not allowing up. me to for some reason. Okay. So people come in as guests. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay, here we go. Let's. I'll go back to sharing mine. See if I don't freeze doing all these functions at once. Okay, so I've opened up in vivo here. I want a new project. I'm going to call this live review and test just so I know. And then uh, this is a literature review oops, of um, the ways that labyrinths have been used amongst children and young people. So what I'm doing is putting in a description of the thing. At every point that we create uh, things within Envivo, we have the opportunity of making a description. I highly recommend doing that. Um, it, also, it means that if you forget what you've done, there's a, a comment that you can go back to. Now, the default, it says, uh, do you want to display save reminders every 15 minutes? I recommend yes. At times, it's a pain in the butt. Every 15 minutes, you get asked, so do you want to save? Um, yeah, please do. It's It really is useful. Now, start the tour. I, that's for, uh, for people who are a little bit unsure about Envivo and how it all works. So there's an opportunity for you to go and um, have a look at some of the functions there. Now, I said that we can set up codes. Codes is where we create labels and we are able to specify parts of our text, put them under these labels or these codes, and then group them either together in hierarchies or as uh, at, at next to each other or in hierarchical groups. Now, I've recommended that we create a folder called general. So all our codes. Now, I'm guessing you can all see my Envivo screen. I'm typing away. Nobody's made any complaints. So I'm guessing you can see it. So this is just like uh, in Explorer that you've got in Windows. You just right click and then create a new folder. And there it is. So I can create a, um, a hierarchy, a set of folders, um, just in uh, just in the same way that you do elsewhere. And it just provides structure to what you're doing and will help you as you go through your literature review. Now, one thing we're going to come to later is to phase our, uh, our coding. So I'm just going to create a couple of folders here just so that we've got them uh, for later. 
I'll explain what phase one and phase two are a little bit later. Now, in general, I'm going to create a code. I want a code for my go find. So hunt out these references for later. Okay, so I've got that for when I need it. Rotations. There we go, created that one. And so I've got three three codes that I've created here without having any data at all in my literature review. So it's about understanding first what it is you're going to try to achieve, getting the tools in place, and then for those people who have a particular framework that they're going to use, getting that ready as well. So in phase one of um, my analysis of my literature, uh, hold on. Okay, I want to create a code in phase one. I'm going to right click and go new code. Now, I need to make a comment about Mac versus PC at this point. Mac doesn't have quite the same functionality that PC has for in vivo. Now, you will find it more than adequate for your literature review. And I've not yet found uh, even a PhD research project for which it wasn't adequate. Where you will find differences um, with NVivo is uh, it, between Mac and PC is when it comes to looking at things like intercoder reliability. So if you're in a team and you are doing a set of coding on data and you've got a team member who's uh, also doing some coding, then the PC version is able to compare uh, the different coding patterns that the two researchers have. Can't do that in Mac. Probably not a, uh, an issue for most student research projects though. Now, the other thing that will be different um, is that static sets, you can see here on the left, there are static sets and there are dynamic sets. Now, static sets are available in PC and Mac, but dynamic sets, which can be automatically filled, that is only available in PC. Again, it's not going to be a limitation on uh, your Apple uh, literature review project, but it's just one, you've just got to do a couple of extra steps uh, rather than rely on some automatic functions. Now, phase one. Phase one, I am going to set it, uh, sorry. Hit the wrong button. Phase one, I'm going to uh, go down to folder properties and backfill. Phase one is uh, clean the data. So make sure I've got everything in place when I bring it in, uh, when I import my files. Now, for those who are working with Mac, you don't go to uh, properties, you go to get info. So labeling is a little bit different between Mac and PC. Um, I will be speaking PC language. I'm sorry, Mac users will have to just do a little bit of adaption, but it's fairly minor stuff there. Phase two, I'm just going to uh, add in here, um, initial coding. So I've set this up. Um, my initial coding, say I've I've got a framework that I know that I'm already going to use. I like um, a particular theoretical framework set up by a person called Margaret Archer. So there are four codes that I want to use there. So auto-reflexive, I won't put the definitions in. Uh, new uh, communicative reflexive, uh, fractured and meta reflexive. So I can establish um, a, a framework again prior to bringing in my literature 
if I know the direction that I'm intending to go with my review. Now, some people will approach their literature review with no framework in mind. It will simply be, how do I extract the different types of information here? Um, for them, it might be a matter of looking at the different methods that are going to be used. And it might be that it's uh, uh, an exercise intervention and they want to go and find all the bits in their literature that, re that refer to the, uh, to the exercise intervention. Or it might be that it's a medication intervention that's being used that you want to go and review. Now, if I go and do all of that, you'll notice already that the codes are starting to become a little bit confused. So let's start structuring our work. Now, autoreflexivity should go actually under Archer. And communicative and fractured, and I'm using the, uh, the control key so that I can highlight all the things together, and I'm just going to drag and drop them. Now, my exercise and my medication interventions are going to go there. Yeah. So you can see that I've already started to structure my codes. So this is a way of giving clarity to the work that I'm trying to do as we progress. And again, this, if you know what you're doing, if you have a framework you want to work with, you can establish this before you go and import data. So, do we have any questions at this point? Let's see if I can. Can these names uh, be keywords also? Oh, can, I didn't catch that, Shastri. Can they be what? Keywords. Keywords. Oh, yes, yes. Whatever is going to be useful to you. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then you've also got the opportunity uh, under properties to give a description so that you know what you meant, or at least you know what you meant at the time. Even if it changes as you go along, you can adjust it. Now, one of the advantages of Envivo is that it is adaptable and flexible. And the other advantage is that it is used to connect things, connect different uh, files and data sources, connect different labels or codes, and connect different cases. Now, the cases might be uh, journal articles, or it might be um, different people or institutions. So it may be that as part of your literature review that you are looking at uh, documents produced by a particular uh, government body. So you can classify your data as belonging to a particular government body and bring that in as well. And you can connect all those different parts together for your uh, review. So this is what we can establish first up. Now, just as some extra things, down here in notes, I want to create some memos. So this is where I keep um, remembering the things that, I, uh, that I'm discovering as I go along and advance in my research project. So I've got uh, supervisor meetings. I create a spot for them. So I can open this up and I can record um, you know, uh, meeting with supervisors on 4th April 24 and 0.1, 0.2, oops. 2.3. So you can record notes and keep all of it together as well. You can also go and create, and I would recommend this, create one for your reflections. So as you have ideas about what you are seeing in your literature review, you can make notes for yourself. So just go and create uh, the memos so that you can keep all the different parts of your literature review process together in this one in vivo project. Now, we haven't got any data here yet. So under files, we need to find our literature and bring it in. 
Now, this is where we need to think about um, our EndNote or other bibliographic software. This is where we include the, um, the references that we have plus their PDF, and we will try to import them here. Now, let me just go and find my, uh, that's the wrong one. Uh, sorry, I opened the wrong window. You know, I'm just going to one of my projects. Okay. When you are storing your data, create a folder on your hard drive or in the cloud, wherever it is you save your material. Save all the PDFs together and in the file next to them, save all the references. So when you're going through the library website and you're finding all these wonderful journal articles, download the RIS file or whatever the format is and, and create your Envivo, uh, sorry, your EndNote uh, file as well and keep them all next together. So that when you have your, you'll have one folder that's just all the PDFs, but then you'll have another folder which has your uh, EndNote material. And within EndNote, each reference, as much as possible, will also contain a PDF. Now, I'm going to my, uh, where is it? Sorry, I've got to open my EndNote folder properly. So it's going to take a minute to open it. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and then flick over to my EndNote. Stop sharing and now let's reshare. Okay. This might look like a bit of a strange project to you, but I certainly I find it interesting. This is a review of literature that says that, uh, that investigates studies saying that engaging with the labyrinth, it's sort of like a maze on the ground, that when kids engage with it, that there are benefits for them. So that was the purpose of my research. So I'm going to pretend that these few documents here are worth me importing. I've already done this elsewhere, but this is just to demonstrate. This is where EndNote and InVivo integrate. So I highlight the ones that I think are going to be of most use. And then I right click. I've checked them there. I'm going to edit. Sorry, file and export. What have I done? Two, three, four, five, six, seven of them. So Windows has opened up this uh, little screen for me. I'm going to save them under a particular name. I'm going to call them uh, library demo. And I'm going to save it as an XML file. Output style for me is um, APA6. So I tell it what the file name is going to be. I save the type as an XML. Make sure you make that change from TXT or whatever uh, default comes up. Change it to XML and then export. And then it goes and thinks, thinks, thinks and should do that for me. Now, I'm just going to check that it did save it where I thought it saved it. And it did. So now I'm going to jump back to Envivo. So I will stop share and go back to Envivo. 
Now, this is where we start to bring in our files for analysis. So we go to data, we go to files, and we're going to import. Now, another good thing that Invivo does is it works with a lot of um, redundancy. So there are multiple ways that I can do this. I'm going to use the, uh, the ribbon at the top. I'm going to import bibliography, and mine is EndNote. And then I have to go and find where the file is. Library demo. And it gives me all these different options. Now, certainly on the first time round, there's no need for me to worry about the different options. I just want it to bring everything in. So it's going to have a little think there. You'll see on the bottom of the screen is the think bar. That green will slowly progress as the items are brought in. Now, is there anybody playing along at home? Anybody want to confess to trying this as we go along? Nope. Okay, mine's a bit slow in thinking. Certainly the more items that you bring at once, the slower it's going to be. Now, I've only brought in seven now. Clearly, by the time I've finished doing a big literature review, there's going to be a lot more than seven documents. Uh, and it will take a little bit longer, depending on the number you've got and how many PDFs and how big they all are. But it's going to import them. Now, I'm assuming you can all see my Envivo page still. Uh, but you can't log in. Okay, we might have to... Uh, at the end, uh, uh, Karen, um, we'll have a bit of a look at your activation and see if we can't get that happening for you. Okay, so here we have five documents. Now, if we look here at the little icon, we can see that these are PDFs that have been imported. And I can uh, double click on one. It will be, that's an interesting one. Double clicked on it, it's going to think and open. It's going to be a little bit slower today because I'm uh, zooming as well. So it chews up a lot of space on my computer, not just on me. Okay. So we've got our navigation pane on the left, we've got our list view in the middle. And over here on the right, we've got our details view. So in this case, I can see my PDF. So this is a wonderful thing. Now, it's not real good for me to have it squeezed on the side, so I'm going to undock it. and Then I can have it open in a separate window that I can play with. So I have that option as well. So that's, uh, please remember that you can undock those things that you're playing with. Now, because this was bibliographic material that was imported from EndNote. Robert, can you just show you how you undocked it again? Sorry, your face uh, was over the button. Yeah, but what a beautiful face. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> can you see it now? Yeah, I can. Thank you. Okay, undock. I'll just show you what that looks like. I'm not sure. Uh, no, no, you should still sit on this screen, I expect. It would just be in its own little window so that I can then manipulate it apart from uh, the rest of the in vivo stuff. I don't know if you can see the undocked window there now. Okay, I'll probably have to stop sharing and, and reshare it, but it's now in its own little window without list view and navigation view. Uh, so I'll just close that down. I'll just open it up again. Okay. So importing data, go to EndNote, highlight the data to be imported, save it as an .xml, now give it a distinctive uh, name, save it in .xml format, go to Envivo and import bibliographic material, and it will bring that in for you. 
Now, I'm just going to stop there and go back to the other screen. Now, are there really no questions at this point? I think I'm going to have heaps of them when I try and do it myself. Oh, uh, and that's quite likely the case. Yeah. But the idea is just play. You can't break anything. So just play with it. But also um, have a talk to um, Postgrad Association um, because it might be that they can arrange for you to have some time with me so as to help guide you through as well. So um, Postgrad Association is really supportive of students and getting your research up and running. And this is part of your research. Um, it's something that they might be able to assist with. Just contact me. Yeah. So you've got your sources. Screen them. Make sure they've got attachments. And then import them. So we've been over that and I've given you a brief demonstration. Now, there is a problem that some of you might already be thinking about. Now, this is my project, which might seem a little bit odd to some of you, what you're doing. But this book here, A Quiet Happy Place, A Children's Introduction to the Labyrinth, is something that I need to include in my literature review. But it's no PDF. So how do I include something in my, um, in my analysis that I'm engaging with using this software? So, what we need to do is realize that we have internal files and external files. There will be some books that you will be accessing or some other materials that you are not able to uh, import into Envivo. Therefore, you use them as external files. Now, again, sorry about the whiplash. I'm going to uh, change screens again. Oops, no, I didn't. Okay, I'm assuming you can see my Envivo file, uh, Envivo page. So what you see listed are the seven. We know it's seven because down the bottom it says there are seven, even if we don't have to count them. Seven internal files for which I can go and do my literature review analysis. But I'm going to click externals here. Excuse me. And I'm going to create an external. So this is going to be for my book. Uh, sorry, it's all just freezing up a little bit. Computer's just a little bit, bit excited running Zoom at the same time. Here we go. So I'm going, going to create a new external. And this one is called A Quiet Happy Place. Okay, and I can go through and I can tell it that it's a reference and the author, I'll explain where all this comes from later, is Cropsy MM. So I can go and, oh, <laughs> I should have done that under author. So I can go through and uh, edit all these details um, so that they're in place for this book as well. So I've created an external file. Uh, it's an external. Oh, okay, let's just pretend. Ah. Sorry, I jumped around the wrong screen. Going back to my labyrinth one. That'll do. Okay, so I create an external, and now I can type in the notes that I think are going to be relevant. This is a useful page, just the capitalization. So on page four, I can read the quote by the author that says, I'm just gonna make something up. Uh, this is a useful tool for children. 
I would type more carefully if I was doing this for real. So I don't have the book, but I have a note that I can then use. So I'll record the things that are important here, and then I can go and code or label them the same way that I can do it for my internals. Now, I showed you that I could imp um, import the or input the data related to the book. Now I can do that because when I brought in EndNote, it created a thing called a reference. If you see over here on the navigation pane, if I look under reference, I will see that here are the different references that I've created. They all have different attributes, but they're a reference type. And the type in this case is journal article. They all have different authors, different years. So all of those things. Sorry, been... well, I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. did I, are you on the wrong screen? We're on you. We can only see you. You are so lucky. <laughs> That's twice. <laughs> It's an old joke, but I got to do it. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. If you look over here on the left, it says file uh, classifications. I open that up and EndNote was automatically used to create a reference thing, a classification called a reference. So now I can open up one of the references and I can see all the different parts of the information that was there in my EndNote file. It's all been brought over. And if I go over here to the um, uh, to the details view, then you can see that there's a, a table has been set up. So you can see a place published, who the publisher was, how many volumes, so all of that data. Now, a lot of it's not going to be useful. We don't always use all the information that we have in our um, EndNote files or our bibliographic files, but the data is there just in case. So that later on, if you want to pull out all of the articles that coded to a particular key concept that were published in 2015, you will be able to do that. So over here, I can sort my uh, things um, show whether column Y is equal to 2015. So it'll pull out these two for me. So it's a way of sorting the information that we've got, and then we can cross-reference it with our coding to key concepts as well. So the bibliographic data is brought in as well as the uh, the content. And if you have been making notes in, um, in EndNote, then they will also be brought over. Now you'll see here, I've just opened up memos and it has brought over the abstracts and any notes that might've been made. So I've just opened up Wicked Wellbeing and you'll see that the abstract is there for me as well. And if I want, I can go through and code that if that's useful. I've got the keywords that have been brought over and assuming I had made some notes, they would also have been included. So you can bring all that information over. Are there any questions at this point? Nope, I've just looked in chat and none have been typed there. Nobody wants to ask a question? I think okay. we're probably going to need to use it to really understand it. Look, that's the way I learned it initially. I just played. Um, I When I first came across this, now I was dealing with a lot more data at that point. I was well into the, the research. Um, so a lot more data than I would have had um, in an initial uh, scoping of the literature. And I just spent a month, it was uh, January holidays, things were a bit quiet. I spent a month making my projects, pulling them apart and then putting them back together again until I understood the concepts and where all the different functions of NVivo were. So look, I thoroughly recommend playing, uh, but also uh, send me a, an email, uh, send me a message 
if you get stuck or you need some tips. So that's stuff that we can work on together and make sure that you have confidence. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I'm going to go back to the screen, uh, to the PowerPoint. So internal files and external files, we've spoken about them briefly. Editable text. Now, depending on how far back you go with your literature review, then it may be that you come across some older material that is not editable text. So look, a, a colleague years ago was looking at the uh, development of the concept around, oh, what was that? I think it was ADHD. Um, it, it went, something like ADHD anyhow. Uh, she was an education student. And what she did was go back to a very, very, very old German source, which wasn't in editable text. In fact, it was in the old traditional German script. So it wasn't in a language that Envivo was able to identify. But even if it was, it was a, a scan of the text itself rather than a uh, rather than text that you could just you know, highlight and work with. So what you have to do then is a bit of a workaround. Either go and type out the text uh, in, say, Word, and then import uh, that Word document into your EndNote file or bring it in as a, another data source into Envivo. Or you can highlight parts of, um, parts of the data itself and uh, make a note and attach it to that as if you were working with a picture. Now, let's go and import a picture that will be uh, useful. Now, I'm going to swap you over. Going to get lots of, um, uh, was it whiplash from changing screens, I'm sorry to say. So let's Think now, but we've got a reference that is not editable text. What we're going to do is import an item. I'm just going to find a picture that I've got. Um, oh, yeah, on the screenshots, they're not coming up. Here we go. So we're going to treat this as if it was some text. I've just accessed this just simply because it's a quick picture. Now, assuming this was something to be included in our literature review, and there are some people who include uh, historic artwork as what they're doing, what you do here, I've just got to move zoom bits around on my screen that are in the way. Okay, what we're going to do is draw a box around the part of the picture that we need. So it might be an important uh, paragraph in text. Going to right click it and we're going to make an annotation. So I'm going to make a note. Here is the head of a blue peacock. Doesn't sound real useful at the moment, but you would have something interesting that you might need to make a note of yourself so that you can um, make an annotation. So it's like scribbling in the, um, in the margins of a page. And we can also code it and say here under general, we've got, I'm gonna create head, oh, I'll call it blue head, how's that? Now, assuming that's relevant, we've made notes on non-editable text that we are then able to play with. So we are able to deal with text that we can't import because it's in a book or something else. And we are able to deal with text that is non-editable because we import it differently or we deal with it as if it was a picture. Now, okay. 
Are there any questions about how to deal with different types of text? Robert, no questions, but I'm going to excuse myself and come back to the recording when I've got it so I can do Yeah, two you've got that things. meeting. Yeah. yeah Thank no, you for your time. That. Lovely to have you along this morning. Thank you. Wish you all the best. Bye-bye. Okay, so now that we have our text imported, what are we going to do? With it? We're going to do our analysis of the text now. Which screen are you looking at? Are you looking at the InVivo screen at the moment? Okay, I'm gonna bring you back to the InVivo screen just to be sure we're all in the same spot. We have here, as an example, on the right-hand side, the Wicked Wellbeing um, article. I'm just gonna play with the abstract here. I'm going to assume that this is something really important that I want to take note of. Wellbeing is an emerging priority that posed a, poses a wicked project. So wellbeing is an emerging priority. I want to create a label or a code that will help me track this piece of data on this document. So I am going to just under general for the moment, create a new code, call it well-being. And then I'm going to look a little bit further and oh, here we go. The broad range of well-being interventions highlights a consensus. Consensus is important. So I'm going to create um, another code called well-being. Now I could do it that way um under well-being click there and on set sus now the question is where did all of that go if we go over to navigation pane on the left you'll find codes it's just loading slowly and then it's under general And apologize for the slow loading here. This is going to show us the list of codes that have been created. So it's just thinking. Just want to demonstrate what it looks like when we have a code and how that might be useful. I'll come back to that. Okay, we've got text classifications, which I've spoken about that's brought in with our bibliographic material. Um, and then we can use uh, sets to help us sort. So we'll look at that after we've got the coding. Oh, it's so slow, I'm sorry. Are you seeing are you seeing my in vivo screen? Uh, no. Ah. Okay, I'll try and share that one again. Ah, hold on. Window just popped up. I think it's one in fifteen minutes save, which is something in the way. Yep, you can see that. Okay, 
So you can see these are the codes that have been created. So I created definitions, go find in quotations way back before the start. And then as part of this coding, I've noted well-being and consensus. So when you look across, you will see it keeps a count of how many files are attached to that label or code called well-being and how many times or how many references there are that have been attached to that label. So if I double click on well-being, it will open that code and show us the, the bits of text that have now been labeled according to that code. So for those who have been working with Invivo for a while and coding, this will be fairly commonplace for you. You create codes um, as you go through, you structure them in how they will fit together, and then you are able to, to pull them all alongside each other. So look, the advantage here is that say you've got 20 different references that are validly included in your literature review, and you've gone through and you've looked at intervention X as described by each one of them. You then go and click on your code for intervention X and it will list all the different times that intervention X has been identified in your, uh, in your 20 different um, pieces of literature. So maybe it's come up in uh, 15 of them and the other five actually it wasn't relevant, but you'll have these 15 different references under each other with that little bit of text being identified. So, okay, here I've got well-being highlighted and that text all by itself has come up. So now I can pull up all the little bits of uh, well-being and see them together. I can see what uh, document it's from. I can click on that and it'll take me back to the document and I can see that the text highlighted. So you are then able to start pulling together all the different key concepts. Now, what we need to do is structure the analysis that we are doing. So if we are going to engage in a, a content analysis, what we'll want to do is establish some different phases. So phase one will be uh, cleaning the data, make sure that we've got all the data in place, make sure that we have all of the non-editable text in a form that we are now able to use, or at least if it's a book, we've typed in the paragraphs that are going to be useful for us and then made some notes. And then in phase two, we will start doing some of the coding. So in general, I've created well-being and consensus, but I don't want them there anymore. I want them in my phase two. So I'm going to drop and drag them down to phase two. So phase two is now where I start to do my initial coding. I'm going to go through each one of my files and start to do some coding on them. So here's uh, the second one. Again, I'm just... Uh, we'll go down here, mental health. Okay, so we'll say that that's got to do with well-being. I'm going to code to a recent code, well-being. I'm going to have a look at my codes in phase two. And you'll see now that there are two files and two references that are connected to this label. And when I look at well-being at the code itself, then I've got them listed here. And then I can start to, to draw my conclusions about, wow, this is a, a really important uh, keyword or code. Uh, this is coming through in two out of my however many uh, pieces of literature. What I will do then is after I've gone through and done my initial coding, I'm going to create a new folder, phase three. I will then copy, oops, um, I'm just going to use the shift key. Uh, copy, go to phase three. Uh, 
and in phase three, been slow to process. I'm going to paste what I copied in paste. Uh, paste into phase three what I copied in phase two. That will mean that I then have a fresh start. I create an audit trail. I won't go back to phase two and do any more work there. I will work in phase three. There it is, I've pasted it there. I will then now work in phase three and say, okay, my methods one here, that was useful. Um, well-being is there, but I might create uh, another code here. Well-being benefit. So do a new round of coding here and then restructure it. So I'm bringing my codes together and uh, develop, developing them under themes. So that will be phase three of my uh, content analysis that's taking place there. So I've jumped through a lot of material here. I'm hoping that some of you have been playing along at home. Do you have any questions or what do I need to go over and explain in more detail? What needs to be shown to you in more detail? Everyone's feeling comfortable. Recording will make more sense once. Yeah, look, once you've got in vivo and can play along with a Karen, I think you will find that is quite a helpful thing uh, for you. Um, okay, I'd like to show you um, how in vivo can use sets as well. Sets is another way of helping you to sort through your data. Now, we've got here, let me just, okay, I'm going to share with you. Okay. This is a, it's just a screenshot, but this shows you sets that have been created. Now, static sets are sets that you just create yourself. So you create this bucket. A set is basically just a bucket that you drop things in so that it's a useful bucket for you. What I've done here is I've used dynamic sets. Now, for Mac users, you don't you can't use dynamic sets, but the same principle will apply. It's just not automated. What I did was I found that, okay, I thought I had 20 different uh, pieces of literature that were going to be useful to me. But then I discovered that some actually didn't have very good, uh, not a very good evidence base. So those that had an evidence base, I coded as being evidence and then allocated them into this set. So now whenever I want to look at the literature that is dealing with an, a good evidence basis, then I will just dip into this, um, into this folder here or into this set on evidence. But then I also wanted to pull apart the ones that not only had evidence, but that they were focused on children. So I coded those documents as being quality children. Sounds a little bit strange, but that was them. And so I ended up with nine different documents. So I thought I had 20, but when I went into my literature review, I was able to eliminate fur uh, others further. I will comment on the, the 11. They've got some interesting things to say, but I have to be careful how I weigh up um, their comments with these ones. So these particular ones have evidence and they speak to children and not adults. So if I'm going to go and do further detailed coding of each one, then I go to this particular set, click on it, I get them listed, 
I can then click on each one individually and pull it up. It means I don't have to keep um, hunting through you know, my list of 20. I can just focus in on these ones that are here as well. Okay, there was something else that I think would be very useful for you to be aware of. And that is to think about what happens when you have additional information to what you were expecting um, uh, that's sorry I've got too many screens open on my computer now engaging content analysis uh, For some of you, you will be looking through your data and you will see in addition to the comments that the researchers made in the literature that you are looking at, they might have included a quotation from a research participant. Now, this is more likely to be in uh, qualitative research reports than in quantitative, but you might find some in quantitative and certainly in mixed methods. But it might be that there are statements that are made that were there for one purpose for the author, but you and your approach to your literature review can repurpose these particular comments. So I know when I was doing my PhD, I was reading this information about uh, how people justify uh, reproductive cloning as a as a potential technology in Australia. And so the researchers said, this is our study, this is what we found, bloody, bloody, blah, blah, blah. And here's what a research participant said. And I looked at that and thought, gee, with the way that I'm approaching my uh, review, I can actually gain more information here. I can distill more um, out, of this, um, out of this quotation. And when I set it aside, alongside all the other quotations I've got, then I actually have this extra pool of data that I'm able to work with. So there are method of methodologies around uh, doing pooled analyses and meta-analysis. So I would suggest considering the potential of a pooled analysis. Again, it depends on the sort of literature review that you are doing and what your intentions are. But it may be that you are also able to uh, get value from the analysis of comments that have been included. So to get that benefit, do your analysis of the, uh, the writings, the conclusions, the methods, whatever's important from what the authors have said. And then go through and where you find a quotation that may be useful or relevant, highlight it and code it and call it something like pool. You don't have to do anything with it at this point. But later on, when you've finished your standard analysis, pull up all the things that have been labelled pool, and then you can go and do your analysis of those particular statements themselves. It's uh, a technique that might actually enrich the review that you are doing. It can provide additional information, additional insight, not relevant to every literature review and to every inquiry, uh, but it, it's something to consider, something to read up on and something to talk to your supervisors about. Okay, I have rambled on and probably given you a lot of whiplash uh, with all the screens. Are there some questions that you have or some confusions that I've created in your mind that needs to be clarified? Now's your big chance. No one willing to write into chat or turn on their mic? Okay, you're approaching your literature review. First thing, Gather all your data together in EndNote or another bibliographic software. Save with PDFs. Import your data with the PDFs by exporting them from EndNote as a .xml. 
those things which don't have a PDF or it's a book or it's uh, in editable text, convert it into editable text or import it and uh, make notes on it or create a memo or treat it as a, as a picture. And then start highlighting and labeling the relevant parts of the literature. And then start gathering all those labels, all those codes into hierarchies, cutting and pasting and drop, uh, uh, pasting and dropping so that you build up your, uh, your structure for your coding. And then you'll be able to start to draw some conclusions about what were the important ideas that came through or where are the, um, which countries are they that are most interested in this topic? You'll be able to pull that out from the bibliographic uh, data or from your coding, uh, depending on how you go with that. Now, these are, um, there are so many different functions within NVivo. Your data will be so varied that at times you may struggle to work out exactly what to do with it, but please feel free to make contact with me. Um, Scupper knows how to uh, contact me and I know they're very supportive of uh, students in their research phase. So I'm sure Alison will be happy to help there, but make contact with me, that's easy. rlingard.su.edu.au. Are there any questions? If you've got specific questions about your specific project, I'm happy to field them now, or if you have something general, or if I've confused you, please ask, and I'll do my best to try and sort out any confusion there. Everybody's gone quiet. Okay, in the chat box, what is the question that stands out most for you at the moment? What is it in your head that you think, I just can't quite get my head around this idea? Or has everybody just left this on and gone away to make coffee? Okay. I think everyone's gone quiet. No, I'm not really question. Just thinking about how I will work through the different phases. Okay, Peter. Work out your method of analysis. If you are doing content analysis, look, whatever it is, call phase one the data cleaning phase. You're not really going to do much other than to make sure that you've got all of your data together and editable. And if not editable, you've got a way around editing it. Then you start phase two. Phase two will be initial coding, going through each individual piece of your literature, highlighting the relevant parts or the relevant concepts and creating a code. So you'll just create lots and lots and lots and lots of codes. And then depending on your method, Phase three will then be where you start to condense some of your codes. So you copy all of the codes that you create, <coughs> excuse me, all the codes that you created in phase two, copy and paste into phase three. And don't go back to phase two. Leave phase two there as a record of what it was. In phase three, start to aggregate um, your themes or start to pull together the ideas that make sense or start to draw things together under the different theoretical um, concepts that are relevant to your literature review. So it's the next level of detail that you are undertaking in your analysis. When you think you've completed that, copy everything you've got in your codes for phase three and drop them into phase four. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry about that. In phase four, start to go through the aggregated codes in their hierarchies, 
and create definitions. So go to document properties, right click, go to document properties, and in the descriptions, write the definition of what you mean by this particular code. So you are starting to not only condense, well, identify with your labeling and coding, and then condensing, and now you are starting to clarify your definitions and pull them all together. When you have finished that, you're able to uh, write a report. You're able to go to Envivo's uh, functions at uh, bottom left in the navigation pane. You will want the report about uh, the codes. So you will want a printout of the descriptions of all the codes. And basically, it will give you your code book. How many codes can Envivo handle? Oh, OK, I don't know. Um, I've worked in projects with hundreds of codes, which can be a real pain. Uh, when you've got lots of them, it can get really messy, particularly in the second phase where you, you are just going nuts with coding. You are creating codes and it's going left, right and center and it all gets a little bit crazy. So in phase three, start to bring them together into hierarchies and it starts to order them down. When you get to four, one of the um, steps that you might take is actually to eliminate the ones that don't seem to be important anymore. So Envivo will handle all that you are willing to make. I'm convinced of that just judging by the amount of codes I've dealt with. Certainly with the amount of documents I've dealt with, I've dealt with, um, <coughs> excuse me, I've dealt with data files containing over a thousand different documents. So I know that it can handle a lot of uh, space. The program does get slower the more that you've got um, in your project. And excuse me. <laughs> and as you will have seen today, as my computer is trying to run Zoom and uh, handle and Vivo, it can slow things up a bit. So it'll do everything you need it to do, but there will be some uh, limitations that develop along the way. And Peter, uh, if you're still there, uh, thank you for the, the comment. I hope things go well with your literature review. Uh, Robert, uh, I'm Shastri here. Hi, Shastri. Um, I'm, I, I have got a, a little bit uh, some confusion regarding identifying the codes. Uh, you can't find the codes? I mean, uh, I have got uh, some confusion in yes. uh, identifying the codes. Okay. Are there any specific rules in 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 uh, naming the codes or tags? Okay. <laughs> the answer is yes and no. Mm. So just excuse me. For example, you mentioned well-being, consensus. Yep. The, these uh, these are supposed to be attributes. They are they are not necessarily be codes. Uh, look, it. Okay, the reason I said the answer is yes and no. Mm. The answer is no because you are free to do whatever you want. However, the answer is yes because you will be establishing methods that you follow. So according to your methodological perspective on your literature review, there will be consistent methods that you need to apply. So establish upfront what the question is that you are seeking to answer in your literature review. What are the theoretical uh, perspectives that you need to consider? What are the chronological, so what are the criteria? So that will establish some of the rules. Now, you can also establish a code book. So there are um, references that talk about uh, creating a code structure. I know Newman talks about code structures. I think there are about seven different points uh, that Newman recommends for including um, for a code definition. It's things like, you know, what's the name of the code? What's the short name of the code? What's the abbreviation of the code? What's included in the code? What's excluded from the code? Um, uh, I think any other notes. So there are different rules that you can establish 
and say, this is, this is, these are the rules that I will follow for my review that apply to how codes will be created, how they will be defined, and um, you print them there so that your reader is able to reproduce your, your literature review if they are so intent, in the same way that a reader might want to uh, reproduce your, you know, the major part of your research project as well. So the codes, you establish the rule. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> you establish the rules and then apply them and edit them as you see those rules need to be edited. So I'm sorry, there's no straightforward answer to your question. And uh, one more thing uh, regarding the um duplicates are not allowed um, ah, while yep. linking the different uh, um different files yep different folders and um, um duplicates are not allowed yes well okay again you have to work out what a duplicate means now generally I would expect that a duplicate means that here is the same information twice, it's not needed. Now, in that case, I recommend that duplicates get sorted out well before you're screening by abstract. So I try to screen out duplicates when I'm screening by title. So if I've got 100 titles that I think are relevant, um, I sort them in EndNote according to title. And I can pick out the duplicates really easily and eliminate them at that point. But I make a note of what the count was, how many were duplicates, and then how many were eliminated. And so I've gone from 100 down to 97. Three were eliminated because they were duplicates. Now, if your literature review was to take notice of how many times a particular thing was said, then maybe a duplicate is useful. Sometimes you will see the same article that has been reproduced in a couple of different languages. Maybe that's relevant. I would think that's rare, um, but you just need to work out what's the significance of it. If it's not, eliminate it. Eliminate it early and make a note of it just as a, just to keep an audit trail. And the can we document uh, this in um, in the in uh, different phases? Yes, uh, well, I would do my elimination in the end note phase before I brought it over into Envivo. However, if having brought it over into Envivo, you discover oh gee, there's a, a duplicate, then you can either delete it from Envivo as you progress, or you can create a, um, you can create a standard set, a set that you, that you copy all of the relevant ones into. So say I've got my 97 useful documents and I brought them into Envivo and then I discover that there's um, one that's no longer useful, two of them are duplicates, and then there's another 10 that are of, um, that aren't of any use after all. So that's another, say, 16 out of my 97. That'll bring me to 80, oh, I don't know, 81. Sorry about the math. So then I create a set, and I just copy those eight, uh, 81 items into that set, and then I just work with them without having to bother about, oh, am I actually mistakenly working on one that I don't want to work with. So there are different ways you can approach it. But the more that you can eliminate the irrelevant data before you bring it in, the better it's going to be for you. That's why I recommend don't bring in the, um, the EndNote file until you've screened by abstract. Um, that'll just reduce so much the, the volume of material you have to work through in NVivo. And Vivo will handle it, but I don't think that it's necessary. I think it's more streamlined to eliminate early, then bring in a focused set into NVivo, which can be further refined. 
Okay, thanks, Robert. And another uh, last question. Uh, this is more general. Like, uh, yeah. suppose uh, we have hundreds of PDF files. PDF uh, files, yeah. PDF files to work on and so many codes. And uh, by chance, if the project is lost, how to recover it? How to record it? How to recover it? Recover. Uh, to record what? That you've lost it or no, to no, back it recover, up? No, no, recover, recover. Or to recover? Mm. Oh, if you've lost it, you've lost it. Um, mm. The best way to recover it is to make sure you've got backups. Now, um, when you create a file, one of the default settings is that you will get a 15-minute reminder asking, do you want us to save? And it will save everything you've done in that previous 15 minutes. So that's the first thing to make sure that you've got ticked. At times, it'll be inconvenient. It'll interrupt your flow of work, but look, I, I recommend it. As a guy who started using NVivo when it was quite an unstable program, um, I've gotten used to saving regularly, and it's really important. So that's the first step. Second step is to back up your program, uh, back up your project. So if it's a, um, if you've got the potential either on a separate hard drive, or if you're using the cloud, and it's it's got to be secure and it's got to fit your look for literature review, it's not going to matter so much. But for your research project and sensitive materials, make sure that um, the way that you are using uh, the cloud or other devices aligns with your ethical approval, but make sure it's backed up there. The other thing to do, which is sort of going to be a last a last ditch recovery, is make sure that all of your literature, um, you know, all your data files, whether that's your journal articles, whether that's your EndNote files, make sure that you've got them backed up as well. Um, I have a I have a, a file a file that I save all the PDFs into that's separate from my EndNote file, which is also separate from my NVivo file. So that if worst came to worst, I've at least got the, the raw data and it'd be awful starting over again, but at least they're there. But with cloud backup, um, those things are in place. Uh, thank you, Robert. And uh, my last question um, regarding uh, the focus, um, you mentioned uh, theories, methods. Yes. Chronology, uh, working uh, across disciplinary boundaries. Yeah. So, of course, uh, you can do focus on specifics, but if we want to integrate these uh, all these uh, focuses, um, you can create them in different uh, projects, uh, in different uh, folders, different. Um, uh, pages like that and to integrate it? Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. The more parameters you have, the more complicated it is. But you just need to be clear about what's important to the research you're undertaking or what's important to this part of the literature review and then structure. So it may be that even within, say, the phase two coding, you have a subfolder where you go and do your phase two coding uh, relevant to, say, the theoretical approaches. And then you, well, excuse, me, excuse me, you may have another folder where you go through and you code relevant to um, you know, 19th century versus 20th century versus 21st century approaches. So again, I think the clue is to structure and be very clear about the bits. So break it down and set things side by side so that you can reintegrate them later when you need to. But just don't do it all in one big muddle. Just um, structure, create folders, create subfolders, and write those descriptions um, in document properties or for the Mac users um, under get info. Okay, thank you, Robert. Uh, thank you very much uh, for clarifications. Okay, I hope that helps.
Okay, Shastri's asked a lot of general questions there and some that are um, certainly apply in the literature review. See the last one with burning questions? Looks like we've got quiet, Alison. Yeah. <laughs> I'll hand it back to you then, Alison. All right. Well, I might stop the recording there.